Well, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. It is wonderful to be here on the concluding Sunday of 2019 as we wrap up another decade. And as we begin to enter into the new, would you please join me in a word of prayer? Father, we do thank you for another year of mercies. We thank you for another year of sunrises and sunsets. Another year that you kept this planet cocooned in an atmosphere to keep us warm, to keep the moisture in, the radiation out, unlike any other rock swirling in your universe. That this is the only place with liquid water, breathable air, life, with men and women made in your image, with reasonable minds and hearts to be able to think of you and to adore you and to praise you, to serve you. That we don't just exist, we have life. We don't just live, we have volition to live intentionally. We thank you for another year of feeding us and clothing us and sheltering us. We thank you for a year that you've given this church for bringing us together, for forming a new family, for the friendships that have been built, for the relationships that have been forged, for the answered prayers that have been uh, offered up. Father, we are grateful to you. And as we do look back, we pray that we would be mindful, grateful, praiseful, for all the good things from our God, from whom all glories come, all mercies flow, all gifts arise. So now be with us as we open your word yet again to prepare ourselves for the coming year. Would you please let it be a year of growing holiness, humility, love, faithfulness, that we might be around this room and join this fellowship a year from now and look around and marvel at all that you've done, of all that's been accomplished, for which you alone will get the glory. And we'll ask this in your son's name. Amen. Well, my family changed insurance companies this last month and always eager to save nickels, particularly with a teenage son now driving. And that is scandalous what they charge for teenage boys and auto insurance. We signed up for a program called Safe Pilot that basically goes on your phone and tracks you everywhere you go and looks for things such as harsh braking, which is an interesting choice of adjective. Uh, phone handling calls, basically, are you being a good driver? So we all got this on our phone, we're driving around and saw this alarming number of dings beginning to appear. We didn't realize that passengers are treated as drivers. So I was driving without my phone, the family's with the phone, and as you see the number of dings grow, you can almost imagine the percentage of discount diminishing, right? These rise, these go down, you can hear the ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching as the dings go up. But I went to go and look at the uh, actual way it worked, and here's what I was relieved to find. There was a 14-day learning period. And when the learning period ends, you'll be able to view your projected discount up to 20% and will reset your driving score so that you have a fresh start. Now, aren't those great words? Learning period, reset, fresh start, <laughs> and not just for auto insurance policies. There's something about a new day, a new week, a new month, a new semester, and especially a new year. To be able to come to something and to look back at what's come before as a learning period. To be able to go forward with better habits, better choices, better savings, safer driving, safer living, but also a reset, a fresh start, a mulligan, a do-over, a trial period. And that's what starting another lap around the sun does for us is it creates an opportunity for us to evaluate where we've come from, where we are, see where we're going so that we can live more intentionally and deliberately that by God's grace, we're better off a year from, we, uh, a year from now than we are right now. That's what we want to talk about this morning from a text in 1 Peter chapter 2 where we'll be looking at the first 10 verses. Peter is that fisherman from Capernaum who became one of the inner three apostles of Jesus Christ. And he is the author of two letters in our New Testament, appropriately called First and Second Peter. And the first book is written to those who are suffering trials due to persecution through their faith. And so Peter writes to them, beginning with an opening benediction, reminding them that they have an imperishable and undefiled inheritance that can't be taken from them and that will never fade away. He reassures them of their assurance in the gospel that the worst this world can do to us is send us home sooner. 
And that's an encouraging reminder. But then he goes on, beginning in verse 13, to tell us how we need to live in the midst of a hostile world until we receive that inheritance. He tells us, first of all, that we should prepare our minds for action, keeping sober in spirit, fixing our hope completely on the grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not being conformed to our former lust, but being holy like the one who called us is holy. Our God is holy, so his people are holy. We are to live in fear, remind, mindful of the fact that we will stand before God someday and answer for the choices that we make. In verse 22 it says, that in obedience to the truth we've purified our souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Therefore we should fervently love one another from the heart. That because we have been born again from the word of God, that is the gospel that is communicated through his revelation, as children of God, we love our brothers and sisters in Christ with a fervent, sincere love because that's what characterizes the family of God, our intense love for one another, which is why Christ said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you, that the love that we have here in this community, and uh, if you notice, we didn't have our normal security guard there at the door. We had a gentleman and someone shared coming in. He said, in fact, Greg was sharing with me, he says, what kind of church is this? And Greg says, what do you mean? He says, all y'all greet each other. You know each other. You're happy to see each other. It's like, this is a community. This was his first Sunday here, and he noticed that. That's what stood out. And by God's grace, that's what we're beginning to form and enjoy. And that ought to characterize everybody of Christ, that we're the loving children of God enjoying family life together. Which brings us to chapter 2. And in the first 10 verses, we're going to see three specific resolutions that God is going to give us for the coming year. Three commands that we're to obey to accomplish three goals that God has that by God's grace at the end of the year we'll see growth in all of these. Namely, that we are to long for the word so that we might grow as God's children. We are to come to Christ so that we might offer spiritual sacrifices as his priests. And we are to be who we are. We are to live our identity in Christ so that we might proclaim the excellencies of God. In the coming year, God wants us to grow as children, to offer spiritual sacrifices, and to proclaim his excellencies. And in order to accomplish those three goals, God wants us to long for his word, to come to Christ, and to conduct ourselves according to our identity in Christ. Those are three resolutions we want to resolve as a church, both individually and corporately, as we begin the coming year. Let's look at the first of these in the first three verses. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Now there's actually five parts to these three verses beginning with preparations. That before we come and feed, we wash ourselves clean of five despicable sins. First of all, that we have to put aside all malice, all ill will towards others, all desire for another person to be hurt, usually because they've hurt us. It's the opposite of love. Love is wanting good for someone else. Malice is wanting something evil and harmful in someone else. We've got to set it aside. All deceit intentional dishonesty by which we mislead others, often to advance ourselves or to harm them, that it's not just something to cover something that I've done to hide my true identity from y'all. That will come later when we talk about hypocrisy. But the idea that I would willfully mislead you either to advance myself or to harm you. It, it fractures relationships that are built on trust. Uh, Dave and I have a good friend named Nate and a very dutiful, disciple-making father. And he had a young boy who was caught in a lie. And so he wanted to address this in a way that his son would be mindful of. And he took him to a coffee shop, took him to Zara's, and got a cup of coffee, got the mug, and dropped it on the ground and broke it. And so they picked up the pieces, they put it back together. And as he started to put the pieces back together, he says, you know, we can reconstruct this mug, but we're never really going to trust it the same way again, are we? We can even put super glue on here and we can remake it where it actually might even be able to hold liquid again, but 
I'm always gonna be a little bit more careful about this mug because I'm gonna see the cracks that have now fractured its integrity. And my son, when you lie, when you deceive, when you're dishonest, you fracture the integrity of our relationship where I can never quite trust you the same again. And that's not something we want because I love you too much to ever distrust you. Wasn't that a great lesson? But deceit breaks trust. And so we can't have it in the family of God. Hypocrisy is a form of deceit where I present a false front to make you think that I'm better than I am. Where I put on a fake face and a mask to hide my ugly heart and my hidden sins. Envy is spiteful resentment of another person's blessings. That I see someone else enjoying a blessing and I hate them for it. And I would rather the blessing or the good thing be destroyed just so long as they don't enjoy it. It's not just a jealousy or coveting that I want what they have. I resent the fact that they have it and I don't. And it's an ugly, corrosive, corrupting sin. And slander, maliciously speaking known lies to destroy another person's reputation. Using our tongues to commit verbal arson to burn down another person's life. And what all five of these sins have in common is they are relational sins. It's not just immorality or pride or indulgence. It's not just laziness or greed or covetousness that I can do on my own. It's something that in a community will fracture that community, that will divide us and cause conflict. And it's got to be put away. It's a word used of laying aside a soiled garment. And so just as in the coming year, we're going to throw away all of our 2019 calendars and all the old stuff that's going to go into the bin, we need to be especially mindful of putting these five sins from us. Because malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander will destroy a community. It'll inhibit our love. It'll foster distrust. It'll create conflict and it'll ruin a soul. People who are resentful and envious and spiteful and malicious rarely do as much harm to the other person that they're hating as they do to themselves. It is corrosion to the soul, soul to let these sins be within us. So the first thing Peter says is, get rid of these out of your life. Be done with these in the coming year. Let this be your old 2019 self and not the 220 self going in. Then, with that negative instruction, comes the positive command to long for the pure milk of the Word. Now, long is a strong verb. It's an intense desire. It's a fervent yearning. It's something that is, we're fixated on. We're, we're distracted until we get it. If you've been absent from a, a loved one and you just couldn't wait to get home and you found yourself rushing and the speedometer going down a little bit further as you rushed home to see your family, that's the way it's often used of Paul longing for his loved ones that he's been away from. It's something that I desire to the point of it being a need. And we are called to long for God's word. That we are to be hungry for the Bible. And he gives us a model to help us picture this, something we can all relate to, that of a newborn babe. Because a newborn babe longs for his mother's milk or her mother's milks frequently. Uh, every two to three hours. Eight to 12 times a day. Even teenage boys don't eat that much. And there is this frequent, I need to eat, I need to eat, I need to eat, that we should feel for God's word. Now, Hudson Taylor, the Chinese missionary, his policy was God's word the first word, God's word the last word. That every morning when he woke up, the first thing he did was open up God's word, that that would be the first thought in his mind as he began his new day. And he kept his Bible by his bed so that before he went to bed, he read a verse and he would go to bed meditating on a scripture. That he opened and closed his days, bookending it with God's truth. Uh, they said of Eric Little, the Scottish runner who became a missionary in China, that when he was imprisoned for his faith, that at 4 a.m. his lamp would go on like clockwork. Because Eric Little was on his knees reading his Bible that day. And there was this frequent need to be in God's word that we should be feeling as God's children. Babies also long for God's word fervently. What happens when you don't feed a hungry baby? They let you know, right? Do they just give a couple of cries and, oh, I guess mom and dad are tired. I'll let them sleep through the night. <laughs> no, that is folly. Uh, I remember Dave saying once we just had to roll our daughter into the closet 
and just close it for a little bit of sleep. A knock once in desperation, went to our next door neighbor and said, would you please watch my daughter just for an hour so I can sleep? Because the babe was wakeful, because the babe was hungry, and there was a fervent desire that wouldn't be resisted. I'm going to clamor and cry until you give me what I yearn for. And that same desire is supposed to characterize Christians, that we are to be hungry for God's word, that you won't settle for anything else being taught or preached other than scripture. There's no substitute for it. There's no false teaching that's acceptable, however pleasant and pleasing to the flesh it may be, because we have to have this. This is our food. And when we don't get it frequently, we have hunger pains in our soul. That I don't feel well, that I feel weak, that my wife sometimes will tell my blood sugar is low. I've got to eat now. In fact, she's gotten to where she carries little food in her purse to be able to, I've got to feed my sugar now. And that's what God's children are intended to have in our desire for the word. Uh, I visited a friend who was living in Cambridge, England, Adam Richardson. And uh, Adam was a doctoral student at the University of Leicester, and he had special access to this wonderful Bible collection there at the University Library that he took me to. And I was able to see and to handle Bibles very, very rare. And one of the things that I saw was the Mary Jones Bible. And the Cambridge Library has one of two in existence. And Mary Jones was a Welsh girl who wanted to have the Word of God in her own language. And so she saved up money for six years. And then in 1800, walked 26 miles barefoot as a 15-year-old girl to buy a Bible in Welsh because that was her <laughs> fervent desire. And having it, she read it frequently. Can you imagine a nine-year-old girl so wanting to be able to read God's Word in her own native language that she saved up for six years so that she could walk 26 miles each way barefoot to buy a Bible, take it home? And it has her name now, in honor of the one who honored God's word so gloriously. It should characterize us because newborns not only long for the pure milk of their, mothers, uh, of their mother, frequently and fervently, but also fruitfully. It enables them to grow. Newborns grow more rapidly than at any other time in our lives. In the first year of life, and Fred can correct me on this, I think a babe will triple its birth weight, which we don't even do during the holiday seasons. And so in a month, a babe will grow three-eighths of an inch. It'll grow three to four ounces in weight a, a, a week, I think. And so it is effective. It is frequent. It is fervent. It is fruitful. And you can see the grow. You can notice the growth. And if we don't, we get concerned. Uh, parents are eagerly coming back from the pediatrician with, my child is only in the X percentile. I've got to feed them more. I've got to show them more videos, play them more Bach, whatever it is. We know that a baby is born to grow, and when they don't grow according to the standards or according to their peers, we get anxious and we do whatever is necessary to make up the gap, right? Because babes were born to grow. Spiritual babes were made to grow. God never intended us to be born again and remain perpetual babes. He never intended us to become a new creation in Christ and always be infantile, to always be immature. We are to constantly be growing in our faith and maturing in our belief and becoming more effective to serve our Lord and becoming deeper in our faith, hope, and love. And the way that we accomplish this is with God's Word. That God expects us, uh, probably all of y'all have on your door frames little pencil marks that incrementally ascend. And what we've done is we have measured our kids to see their growth and track their weight. We have progress reports that we keep and save and boast of. God, our Heavenly Father, wants us to be further along this time next year than we are now. More humble, more holy, more loving, more joyful, more at peace, more like Christ. And the means that he has given for us to accomplish that good goal is the word of God, which is why we have to yearn for it and to long for it and to desire it like a newborn babe. Because our flesh and the world and the devil are going to be fighting all those tendencies that God desires in us. That in and of myself, 
I would want to be the husband that my wife is. So there's an economy, right? I give to my wife, so she gives to me. I give to her to get from her. But that's not the way that marriage works in Scripture. And so I read Ephesians 5 that God wants me to love my wife as I love myself, as I love my flesh, as Christ loved his church. And I don't run my marriage the way the rest of the world says to. I'm not going to barter and trade and bribe and bully to get what I want in my marriage. I'm going to love like Christ loved because that's what the word tells me to do. And the word is going to tell children to rebel and defy and to be disrespectful and to shut off and to isolate and to be individualistic. And they're going to read in the Bible that they are to respect and obey and appreciate and help and submit to their parents. And parents tend to get distracted. We're just going to preoccupy our children with electronics. We're just going to rule them with a rod of iron until they get big enough to defy us or run away. But the Bible says, no, I am going to raise them up in the fear of the Lord, and I'm not going to exasperate them. I'm not going to provoke them. I'm going to not be a hypocrite but model certain things for them. That we're going to enter into a political season that's going to be ugly. And we're going to see on the radio and television all around us people that are disrespectful. But we're going to read in Romans 13 that I'm to be in submission to my governing authorities. And I'm to give honor to whom honor is due. And I'm going to behave differently in a political season than the rest of my country. That even in church, the tendency is I come when I want, I leave when I'm offended. And that's not what the body of Christ is. And so we read in 1 Corinthians 12 that we are a body and we need each other. And when I'm not here, y'all feel the absence. When y'all aren't here, we feel the absence. That we're a family and we miss one another. And we are a temple and there's a missing chunk gone that someone's knocked out when we're not here. And we're not going to approach church the way that the world does because the Bible tells us differently. And there's going to be hardships in this coming year. There's going to be unexpected surprises and some that are fears and they're going to be realized. And we're going to need faith for that. And that faith is going to be fostered by the truth of God's word. We're going to be discouraged and tempted to despair. And so we need to renew and refresh our hope with the truth of God's word. We're going to need sustenance and perseverance and grace and forgiveness. And all of those things we're reminded of and taught of in God's word. And so the first thing Peter tells us is make it your resolution to long for the pure, unadulterated milk of God's word so that by it we may grow in respect to salvation. Now, on a practical level, um, if you've never read your Bible before, can I encourage you just to start by bringing your Bible to church? That's a start. We put it up on slides for those that don't have it, but bring your Bible and read along, and then that week, just read the text that we're in, in the pulpit, and just get in the habit of opening God's Word and find out that it's more readable, more understandable, more accessible, more delightful than you realized. Some of you are already there, and the challenge may be to read it daily. If you will read your Bible 15 minutes a day, you will read your entire Bible in the next year. So shorter than a sitcom, you will be able to read the entirety of God's Word to you just start the habit. Just build the discipline. Begin to foster a regular conversation with your father the way you do with your children or your spouse or your friends. And there's a number of ways to go about doing this. The reading plans are abundant. My wife likes to read a chronological Bible one year that organizes the Old Testament especially chronologically. And then she alternates with the canonical order of just going Genesis to Revelation. Uh, my favorite plan that I've been using about 20 years now, I think we have a slide of it, which you won't be able to see. I hear groans already. But there are copies for you at the visitor's table in the foyer. What this does is have as an abbreviation for the book of the Bible and then the number of chapters for that book. So GE for Genesis, 1 to 50. MT for Matthew, 1 to 28. And all you do is as you read a chapter, you circle it, you mark it out, you indicate in some way that you've done it, and by the end of the year, you want all the chapters read. And the reason that I love this is when I would do my Bible in the year that just went through the Bible, uh, Genesis to Revelation, is I might find myself in First and Second Chronicles, and that is not what my soul needed that season. <laughs> that I would be in some of those drier paths of Scripture, 
and I would need the Psalms or something to succor my soul in a difficult hour. And so this gives me the freedom to read anywhere in Scripture that I feel compelled to. And so on uh, January 1, I will likely read Genesis 1-1 and then just think about God the Creator, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then I'll jump to Psalm 19 about the heavens are declaring the glory of God. And then I'll jump to Psalm 24 that because God created all things, all things to belong to Him. And then I might jump to Revelation 21 and 22 and think about the new creation. And as I move through that thematically, I'll just check, move through each, and then I'll go back. And if I'm really enjoying seeping myself in the Psalms, I have the freedom to do that. And on a plane ride or waiting some time, I might read through the book of Joel or the book of Daniel just in one sitting. And by the end of the year, I've gone through the Bible and I've made sure that I've read all of God's inspired and errant word for me. That everything that he laid out on the buffet table, I enjoyed a little bit of everything. But whatever plan you use, commit yourself to starting to read God's word more frequently, more faithfully, more fervently, and you will find it fruitful in your life and you'll see yourself grow. Your spouse will see you grow. Your children will watch you grow and will watch each other grow together. Some of you uh, may have gone to visit family over the holidays and you saw someone you haven't seen in a while and what's the phrase we use? My, how you've grown, right? That's what we want to be able to do with each other. That a year from now we look around and say, Becca, my, how you've grown. You're even godlier. Eileen, well, you couldn't grow anymore. You were already so godly. No, but... <laughs> But we should be noticing each other advancing in Christ's likeness as we feed on God's word. That's the first resolution for us. The condition, though, in verse 3 is, if you have tasted of the kindness of the Lord. There's no growth where there's no life. For a babe to grow, the babe must be born. And so there's some here who may not know Jesus Christ as their Savior you may not have been born again, which is the prerequisite for growing in the Lord. And there'd be no better way to start a new year than with a new life, than becoming a new creation in Christ. And the good news of the gospel is simply this, that there is a God who made absolutely everything, including you. And that God is perfect, but we're not perfect. And we don't obey him not only as we should, but as we're demanded to. There are things that are wrong that we do. There are good things that we don't do. And there's things that are good that we do with bad motives. None of us are perfect. And therefore, none of us are able to stand before God as our judge in and of ourselves. But God loved us so much that he sent his son to become a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. And he lived the perfect life that we could never live and took all of that righteousness and put it to our account, treated it as though it was ours. And on the cross, he took all of our sins that we did and paid the penalty for it by dying for us. And now, all we have to do to become a child of God, a son or daughter of the King, to have all of our sins forgiven and become a new creation in Christ, is to say, God, I am a sinner. Jesus saved me. And when we do that, and that accurately and sincerely communicates the desire of our heart, in that moment, we are born again. We become a new creation in Christ. All of our sins, though as scarlet, are bleached, and we become as white as snow. And we are promised to be reckoned righteous by God. In fact, we are declared righteous in that moment. And when we die and stand before Him, we will spend an eternity with Him, not because we were good, but because Jesus was. Not because we were worthy, but because Jesus is. And that is the good news of the gospel that is offered to every one of us. But you have to choose to receive it. You have to accept it. You have to embrace it. And there's no better way to start the year than to do it. If you have any questions about that, ask someone here today before you leave, please. Which brings us to our second resolution that God has for us communicated in verses 4 through 8. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, 
you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumbled because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom, they were also appointed. Now there's way too much in here for us to unpack in the brief time that we have. But in short, God sent his son as Israel's Messiah, and they were offended by his teaching and stumbled over his message, and they rejected him and they crucified him. But he was precious to God who raised him from the dead, which is why he is called a living stone. And the stone that they stumbled over, he made the cornerstone, the foundation stone of the new temple of the church, so that all who do believe in him, all who do receive the gospel, become living stones ourselves, identified with his resurrection, and God is building a new temple. And every time that a new person gives themselves to Christ, they become a new stone in the temple of God. Every time the gospel reaches a new region or nation, a new wing is added to the temple of God so that we can serve him as priests, as those who can approach the throne of grace with boldness, as those who can represent God before others, and so that we can offer sacrifices to God. Now, we don't offer animal sacrifices for forgiveness or atonement because Jesus Christ died once for all. Those sacrifices are done. But we offer spiritual sacrifices in the sense that we bring offerings to God, gifts to God, ways of expressing praise, thanksgiving, gratitude, worship, fellowship. And when we offer things to God, we worship Him in what the Bible calls sacrifices. A few of these that the New Testament specifically mentions are, in verse, uh, Romans 12:1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. <clears throat> that the first sacrifice, the primary sacrifice we offer to God is ourselves. That we realize that He made us so we belong to Him. He redeemed us so we belong to Him. He's our Lord so we belong to Him. We belong to God by right of creation, redemption, and lordship, and so we come and give ourselves back to God. And we live for him and not ourselves. Philippians talks about the gift that Paul received. He calls a sacrifice. He was serving in jail, serving in Philippi, preaching the gospel. They gave a financial gift, and that was a sacrifice. That was a good gift. That was an investment in God's work around the globe that God considered a pleasing aroma, a pleasing offering, a participation in his work. And Hebrews 13 tells us, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips and give thanks to his name and do not neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So when we walk out and we see a sunset or a sunrise and we praise God or when we see the spring trees and flowers begin to bud and bloom and we praise him, those are sacrifices that are pleasing to the creator of the world. That when we pause and say thanks, God, thank you for family. Thank you for this church. Thank you for my country. Thank you for all the things you've given me. When we are appreciative of God's blessings, that's a sacrifice of praise. When we share with what we have, that God is the giver of all good things, and he gives to us so that we can experience the joy of giving. Those of you with young children, and they started wanting to give Christmas gifts, where did they get the money for their gifts? From you. Why did you give them money to buy a gift that wouldn't have been as good as you could have bought for yourself? Because you wanted them to enjoy the joy of giving. That it is better to give than to receive. So you gave to them so that they could give. God gives to us so that we can give. And we become like Him in that regard. And when we do good deeds, when we serve one another, when we help, anything offered up to God in appreciation, gratitude, and service for His glory is a sacrifice. And so as his priest, as his temple, we want to go forth into this good new year more grateful, more appreciative, more thankful, 
more prompt to praise, more eager to glory, more happy to worship, more excited to serve, more prompt and generous to share what we have. And all of those things are why we're priests. Which leads us to our third resolution, our third goal that God has for us. That we are to be who we are in order to proclaim God's excellencies. He's going to give us descriptions that were initially used of Israel in Exodus 19, but they were contingent. When God redeemed his people out of Exodus and brought them to Sinai, he said, if you will obey me and if you will keep my covenant, then these things will be true with you. But Israel didn't obey. They weren't faithful, just like we don't obey and we're not faithful. But because Christ obeyed it, because Christ is faithful, these things are now true of us if we're in Christ. Namely, that we are a chosen race. We are a people that God has called to be himself. That out of all the peoples of the world, he picked us to belong to him. That we're a royal priesthood. We are a kingdom of priests. We are nobility who is also able to represent and enjoy and approach God. That we are a holy nation. We are God's people to be holy because God is holy. We are a people for God's own possession because we're precious to him. We are blessed with all these things in Christ so that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness to live in his marvelous light. Because we weren't always a people, we Gentiles. And we didn't always receive God's mercy, but now we have in Christ. And God wants us this year to remember who we are so that we proclaim his excellencies to those who don't know him yet. Because we have so many excellencies to proclaim that our God is so kind to us and so patient with us and so long-suffering that his grace is so amazing, that his love is so unconditional, that his faithfulness is so great, that he is so compassionate, that he is so forgiving, that he is so wonderful, that he's so excellent, so glorious. And we want to gather together regularly and sing and proclaim that together. That we want to go into our families and raise our children knowing that our God is a glorious God. That we want to be eager to tell others about just how good our God is and how he's a better God than the ones that they're serving. Don't give yourself to serve and to sacrifice and to ruin your life and to throw away your marriage for the God of success and money. Don't go into the false gods of the world that are going to betray you and fail you someday. Worship and serve and enjoy and put your faith and trust and life in the one true God, because he's excellent like none other. There is no other God like our God. And we want to proclaim him in our homes, in our workplaces, on our streets, in our families, among our friends, and in this community that God has placed us. To invite them to come in, because right now they don't know God's mercies, but they can. Right now they're not his people, but they can be. And so we want to go and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And we can be as creative as we can on this. Uh, I don't know if y'all saw Hobby Lobby's Christmas ad. I was so encouraged to hear this yesterday. A full page ad that just says in the reveal blue, it's a boy. And in minuscule letters that unto us a child is born, a son is given. And then in letters below that, if you would like to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Go to this website to find out how. Go to this website to download a free Bible. And at the very bottom, Hobby Lobby. They're not promoting themselves. They're not proclaiming themselves. They've got something bigger and better to proclaim at Christmas. And we can be as creative as we can on this. But everything we do, we do to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do to the glory of God because He is worth glorifying. The new year's upon us. In fact, 2020 is a leap year. God gave us a bonus day. <laughs> we get some extra hours. And so when you do the math, we have 366 days. We have over a half million minutes, over 8,700 hours to long for God's word that we might grow in respect to salvation. To come to Christ that we might offer spiritual sacrifices. And to live out who we are in Christ so that we might proclaim the excellencies of the one who delivered us out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his light. 
Let these be our resolutions individually and as a church. Dean, you let us long for the word to grow as God's children. Let us come to Christ to offer sacrifices as God's priest. And let us be who we are to proclaim God's excellencies. Let's let this coming year be a transforming, a growthful, a sacrificial, a praiseful year to give glory to our great God and King. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you for restarts. We thank you for resets. We thank you for New Year's. You could have easily just fixed the heavens where the sunlight always shone and it was just 24 hours of daylight and nothing ever changed. You didn't have to create days and weeks and months and years, but you did. And we're grateful. And as we come to the conclusion of a year, we want to thank you for your grace and mercies, your gifts. We want to confess and ask forgiveness for our sins and shortcomings. And we want to recommit ourselves to you. We want to offer our bodies a living sacrifice to you. We want to be more deliberate, more intentional, more obedient, more pleasing in the coming year. To be able to enjoy the joy and the peace and the full and fulfilling life that you have for us when we walk according to your will. So Father, give us a hunger for your word that we might grow. Let us keep coming to Christ that we might offer spiritual sacrifices. And let us live out who we are, kings and priests of the living God, that we might more eagerly and effectively proclaim the excellencies of our Savior. And we'll ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.